Welcome to this new episode on uh, Cooperative City in Dialogue. Today, we have the pleasure to talk about exploring uh, exciting games and digital platforms to interact and design our cities collectively. We will be uh, we will be moderating this episode online. Giovanni will be with you in the chat and he will make sure that all your comments, reactions, feedbacks or questions will arrive our guest today. Um, my name is Bahano Nasia from Utropia. Me and my colleague Levente Poliak will moderate today today's episode and um, interact with our guests from different cities. Levente? Uh, you are muted, Levente. I think you wanted to tell that we have four experts here from different cities. So uh, we have people coming uh, to us from Portugal, the SSCSO locals, and they developed a very interesting uh, game to, for urban development. We also have uh, Silvia Jargo from Budapest, uh, who's a member of Mindspace, and she's been working on uh, different kinds of gamification for again urban regeneration in mostly in Budapest and elsewhere and they're also running an international conference on games and the city. We have also Olivier uh, Schulbaum from Platonic who's been involved for the last decade in um, let's say uh, direct and deliberative democracy and they're using games in order to uh, complete the, let's say, the gaps of the democratic processes we have. And Ileana Toscano, who is a lead expert of uh, Playful Paradigm and Urbex Network. And uh, so she is working on how to, how to help cities learn from each other about uh, gamification. So I would like to start uh, with uh, Joao and Gonzalo, who reach us from Lisbon. Am I correct? Are you in Lisbon? Yes, Lisbon based, but... But not, uh, but we are Portugal based, by the way. I mean, Lisbon, João is in uh, Pombal, Leiria, but uh, we, are, uh, we are in Portugal. Okay, great. It's great to have you here. I think we met last time, Gonzalo, maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago. It was very hot in Lisbon, and you told us, you showed us a little bit the game that you were developing uh, for the Bibzip program, which is helping, let's say, disadvantaged neighborhoods come together, join the forces, and uh, develop projects. Can you? Tell us a little bit about this game. We have met even before. We were in Murcia uh, in the in a, in a conference that talked about even the how do how the platforms could enable people uh, people's in a, into participatory processes. Um, before going into the the game deep, uh, do you want me to put uh, our presentation uh, right away? Okay. Uh, but before going deep into the game, it's uh, it's important to make this wider frame of uh, how this game appeared in the, in what was the context. So I'm going to share the thing over here. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. João. Uh, okay. yep. If I forget something, you yeah, just yeah. go ahead and you pop in. We will do it as usual. <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, just to this, I'm disclosing all the presentation. So, in order to to to, to reach the the game, we have to understand this uh, project uh, that's had that had happened before, which was for Urban. For Urban was this uh, uh, response to a gap that there was on the on the city of Lisbon. We had a lot of uh, different projects going on, but the repository that the municipality was providing us with was uh, kind of confusing and it was uh, with huge PDFs and you have uh, like... Technocrat PDF. Technocratic yeah. uh, stuff, too much exactly. techno technocrat, yeah. And it was not easy or soft for a citizen or an NGO or whoever it will be to understand what kind, what kind of projects were happening in the city by reading a 15 pages text PDF. So we came by up the with way, this Gassal, idea. Sorry, Go ahead. projects. We are talking about deep sea projects. Exactly, exactly. So we came up with, uh, with this idea to make something that could systematize and to centralize all of this information so it could be accessible for everyone. And by doing that, we have reached this, uh, this platform, forurbano.pt. Um, and you can search the different kind of projects uh, by uh, 
territory, by uh, community, by year, by the ways that they are doing, by the thematic, by the groups that they want to, to impact. In fact, you can make it, uh, you can make this in a, um, in a combined selection and you can see which were the projects working uh, with elderly people on the year 2006 in the Judas Parish and it appears to you so it's a it's a repository of information and by doing this by having this uh, systematized uh, information by entity beneficiary, beneficiary year location teams uh, ways of doing it we've reached the the, the game uh, Initially, it wasn't supposed to be a game. It was supposed to be a manual, but and we still, were... and it's still not a game. It's the, it's the way we read it. It's by exactly. playing it as a game. Yes, exactly. That that's the that's the point. The the thing. It was okay. Can we make it a, a normal manual when you can go page by page with some infographic or some photography and some text? And we were like, no, that's not the that's not cool. Uh, that's not the, the the way that I would like to to read this information. So we have created this local development manual uh, that you can read it by playing with. Uh, you have three sets of cards uh, on this uh, on this deck. You have the yellow ones, which are the the goals. You have the the strategy ones uh, that are the blues, and you have the project or the activities one that are the the reds. And you may you might ask, what is the difference between them? It's none. It's not. It's some academical thing that the people, uh, when when we are drawing the tree of project, we have this uh, goal, methodology, and uh, and project or activity. And but when we are going to the field, everything, every every these activity, they mix into each other. So it's a complete mess. So the way uh, why we have separated this is to show uh, to everybody that this uh, that this academical thing it's cool for systematizing. But when you go when you go to the field, when you are in the action, all of these things uh, it's quite mixed up. The cards they have this front and they have this back, and on the back they. Um, they have the verbs or they have the, the kind of imp impacts that the cards could uh, could generate. One, one really important thing that I forgot to say is that all of the cards that are over here, they are not something that we have came up with or we have invented it. They are all based in real projects that took action in Lisbon in real projects with real impacts. You can see it uh, here in the bottom uh, in the bottom left of the cards, you have the the project and the year that uh, that uh, that that action took uh, took place on the territory on the community currency. You have here Fabrica Alcantramar. On the open source, you have Projeto uh, Projeto da Ajuda. So it's all uh, it's all things that have happened in the in the in the territory. So just one thing, Gonzalo. So if you went back to that map to that platform where the map showed. Um, basically, it's uh, all those numbers that you see, 34, 5, 4, all those are projects. So the cards are 90 cards. I, th I think you forgot to say there yep. are 90 cards in the total. And what we did, um, we uh, 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 systematized that information into 90 cards, into ways of doing it, into projects. So all of those projects are now 90 cards, let's say. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the point. So initially, this uh, this manual slash game was designed to make it uh, offline, to make it in a really uh, physical approach with people. Either they could be technicians, they could be uh, inhabitants, they could be uh, different, all the kinds of uh, communities that we came up with. Um, and when we were doing this with the communities and the technicians, we could see that this was a really uh, a really hardcore tool in order of uh, facilitation of dialogue it put it evens the balance you can be a, a real experienced technician with the phd and all the degrees you can get and you can be an inhabitant uh, uh, like a proletarian one or a, or some or someone without uh, all of those uh, of all those formations but uh, as you got these cards on your hand, you are immediately uh, uh, compelled to think about the territory that you're living, the community that you are inserted in, and the goal that you want to impact. And the dialogue, it's really uh, horizontal. It's really, it's really even because... Um, as I as I told, this is a mostly mostly of all a tool of facilitation. But 
then COVID happened and we had to rethink ourselves and to, uh, we had to, to adapt the game uh, into a digital uh, thing. Currently, you, we are using Miru, this uh, collaborative uh, uh, platform that is already existing. And we have done this uh, first session uh, uh, on this community lab session uh, with the Utropian, uh, Red LBC, Municipality of Lisbon, uh, and with other uh, eight uh, cities. We've done the first, uh, first, uh, first test drive of the, of the game. Then we have came up this is the thing that I, I would like to highlight this, uh, this evolution because this first prototype was uh, made in, into a room, at, uh, let's say a building of two rooms. And then for the, the great session, we have done already uh, an entire neighborhood. In fact, João draw all of this uh, neighborhood. And I think if we get a little more time, João would, dry, would draw the entire city. Yeah, uh, it's for the next phase, it's for the next phase. It's the next one. Yes. Um, so uh, the game, um, the game dynamic. Um, I would say that we have uh, almost like a, a tailor-made di game dynamic because this game can be played like tons of ways. Okay, in locals we play this with all the deck, uh, but for this game, for instance, there was uh, six, seven people around the table. Each of those people uh, have received 10 cards, 10 randomly uh, attributed cards. Uh, and why randomly? Because that's a way of emulating uh, the, the reality scenarios because no, nobody on this, uh, on this room, nobody in every room would have would like to have the cards or the resources that they would like to have to to solve all the problems together all the opportunities that they got on their territory so this is a way of us uh, to, to to emulate to simulate this reality as well so and this was a, a six uh, six round game on the first round from the 10 cards you receive you would put uh, two cards on the on the on the okay you are seeing all the cards around here uh, from the those 10 cards you receive you put two cards on this white rectangle the second phase is is to 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 choose one of uh, of those cards that you that you have put it on this rectangle on the the hexagon then we had this third um, this third uh, phase of the game which was what draw i'm not remembering it was to go back and get another card for the for the um, for the white rectangle exactly the, the project and then you've got a, a big picture of your project you have almost a project done but then on the fourth round you have this uh, covid uh, covid Crisis. scenario and you mm -hmm. and you have to to put it out three cards from your project so you have to prioritize what are the things that you want to have in your project and this is a uh, all this is also an exercise of understanding what's important and what's not so important. Then the fifth round, it was to get one of the cards, one more card from each player to, to this yellow rectangle over here. And from those six or seven cards, you have only, you got to choose only one to insert on your, on your project. And then the sixth round, it was the pitch one. It was to rearrange this uh, this uh, this layout of uh, of project. Joe, I think you have some videos on the on the on the yes, thing. Yes, just just before, um, uh, I think it's important to say that uh, 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 it is a game. Yes, uh, we have fun playing it. But uh, one of the most important things is it's the debate, the 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 debate that people in that table, so uh, a table represents actually a collective uh, in the end and in the beginning. Um, so yes, it's by round, by playing two cards, then you take one and then you choose one. Yes, it's a round, it's a phase game. Uh, but in the end, what, it, what happens by those playings is that you are prioritizing which card is the one, the, the, the best one to solve, to, to answer that problem, that uh, goal, to aim that goal. Um, and in the end, the, 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 com the combination of uh, those cards, the hexagons, because here you can see, let me just do something here really quick. This is the original game. It's in Portuguese, by the way. We already have translated it into English, but it's still, it's still not in card, you know, in a, in a, in a physical, physical, way. physical way. But 
as you can see, when we put them, we can put them in front, in back, we can uh, uh, glue them, we can join them, we can separate them. So in, in a graphical way, in this uh, graphical way of putting the cards in the table, it's also a way of explaining, it's a, 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 facilita a facilitation tool also to explain the project, the idea behind it. So it's a, a graphical way to um, to easy uh, to easy uh, to make it easier to explain the ideas behind this collaborative project that uh, 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 each group is is uh, 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 is creating. Um, but yes, this is the mm -hmm. just another thing. We have a lot of ways of playing it in the real manual. We have three ways. Yeah, this is a harmonic okay. thing. We mm -hmm. have uh, uh, three ways of playing it, but. Um, we've been doing it uh, uh, personalized for each session because sometimes the goal is what we want from that session is different from what we might want in, for, for example, for us in Locals Approach, when we use it, we use it in our own way. Uh, so okay. it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's also that, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. No, no, I, I just have one quick question before we move on, because mm -hmm. we have only one hour for the whole discussion. Yes. Is that in, in, you develop this game in the context of maybe somebody who doesn't know the Bib Zip? It's a, it's a program by the Lisbon municipality, and now I think it's spread to the whole uh, Portugal to help mm -hmm. disadvantaged neighborhoods develop projects. Uh, there's a startup fund that uh, helps uh, different organizations and individuals come together and build projects together so you are helping this process here but it comes from a uh, municipality environment which uses of course a very different language is trying to be neutral um, and then you are using a completely different language of the game how did the municipality you know accommodate this new language how did they understand the process how did they adapt to this process they were really excited uh, by doing that because um... Let's uh, let's see one thing. Uh, Bipzip uh, is a municipal uh, is a municipal uh, municipal municipal municipality program uh, that is held by this uh, local development department, and they had the the, the same uh, the same need that to, that we had in order to detechnocratize the um, and to simplify the the language that uh, that sometimes it's used when you are talking with uh, residents associations when you are talking to informal groups that are 99.9 percent .9 the times the people that provide you with the right information for you to get your interventions on your on the on the territory because they live there for for the most data, the, the most technical data that we've been collecting through uh, through the, the strategies and the, the census and everything, this is a uh, this is as a, as well a really useful data that these people have. But sometimes when the municipality and the technicians are talking to this group of people, there is a gap in the in the way they communicate and. The game, since has a, a dynamic that is really simple, the, even the language, the the the, te the, the small texts that you have uh, on the cards uh, here, they were really uh, they were really well uh, well well done. Uh, and this is uh, this was uh, a work uh, provided by Joana Pistana. She was really uh, careful and attention in order for those words to be simple to explain complex things. Uh, the municipality just embraced it. It, it was uh, it was a win-win situation. More, more than a fund, <laughs> just one quick thing. More than yeah. a program, they were also partners in this sense. In this, Perfect. In, in this I case. think this yeah. is a very good example of how the collaboration can work and how you can simpli simplify administrative um, issues to to regular citizens. Uh, we heard the word facilitating, and this is also a very good keyword uh, to fly from Lisbon to Budapest to Hungary. Our next guest is Silvia Sargo from Mindspace, and she is a facilitator and she supports processes um, where processes for individuals, but also for groups and tries to uh, develop the best or um, facilitates the best uh, outcome uh, of situations. Silvia, where are you uh, right now? I saw your baby. Thank you for joining us with your baby. Um, would you like to tell us more about your work and Mindspace? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, I just um, 
took my baby away. So maybe we have some rest. I shared the link with you because since I shared my screen, I cannot open it again. It's actually a Facebook picture uh, gallery. So it should work for all of you. If any of you could share your screen because uh, I couldn't open it since. Uh, until you do it, so we founded Mindspace uh, 10 years ago, and since then we deal with urbanism in many different ways, using gamification, finding the connection with the city and the river, uh, mobility, and uh, recently we are um, working a lot with uh, inclusion and uh, and uh, processes with the uh, community planning, but uh, the project uh, about gamification I'm, I'm, uh, I want to share with you is, uh, yeah, if you enlarge the pictures, then we see it with only the pictures and, and not you. So, so in uh, 2014 and 15, we organized two conferences called Mind the Game. Uh, it was actually uh, on the topic of connecting gamification and the city. At that time, it was only about, uh, it was mostly offline topics. So uh, both years we organized a game before the, the event. So you see the pictures of the 2015 game and it, it was an October night. You see people dressed up. It was actually very cold and it was still very popular. Like 30, 40 people came and it was within a district called Palace District and, and some other district that with which we actually did a lot since then, even. And the aim of the game, uh, I mean, I love urban games, I love games, people love games, but I think if you connect it with urbanism, you need to have a goal. I mean, people love to play, people will come and play anyway, but most of the time, the way we use it is to, to give a purpose to it. And our purpose was to, to connect the people more to the neighborhood, to, to un, uncover some of the local secrets and some of the historical topics. Uh, yes, that's my son. And uh, so this way we, um, we, we came up with, with really fun uh, examples. So for example, if you see this and, and the guy beforehand, if you, if you can go back, uh, then, for example, Hungary has a, has a lot of spa culture and it has a, a crack, uh, crack of these thermal spas. And so this guy in that weather of October was actually in his swimsuit sitting with a, with a steaming uh, a pot. And, and, and in our spas, it's, it's very often old people go, I mean, many different people go, but in the old days, like the politicians, many of the big, uh, you know, things were, were done in the spa. So this guy was sitting there with a, a pot of water steaming and we had to, uh, the groups, well, we had teams, like we had six groups or six teams of like five to six people and, and they had a special uh, route they had to, to uh, go through. And for, for example, with him, you had to play a, 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 sh a quick begemon. So, I normally in the spas they play chess, but that would have been too long. But if you uh, skip to the next uh, picture, you see the Begemon table. And, and this was like out in a public space in, well, right across uh, Gellert Spa on, on Fővampir. But this was uh, referring to this uh, political uh, or, or the history of, of the spas and, and all these um, big stories that, that happen in the spas. And if you go forward, you see the water, uh, you know, we have the Danube and, and many times it floods. Yeah, you can stop in this picture. So there is this sculpture. It's not a very visible sculpture. Like many people just pass by it normally because it's on the facade, like on the right side, you see the map of Budapest and in marble, it, it shows how the Danube was flooded covering like, I don't know, 20% of the, the area. Of, uh, of Budapest. So we, this was one of the biggest floods and, and the lines show how large uh, the river was at that time or how high. And then the teams had a, a special, uh, ex exp they had to experiment with water and they had to like a mathematical, you know, if you have two bottles with three pints or that one. And so anyway, they had some, um, riddle they had to solve with water and of course the way they they found the spots they had a map but not always 
it was 100% obvious where they had to go. So for example, at this spot, I asked two people from my choir to sing things of the Danube. So that's how the teams found us that there were two people singing songs of the Danube. They had some exercises with water. So anyway, they had these kind of uh, topics. One more thing I wanted to show if you just go through the pictures. We also give the team, like here again on the previous picture, it was very new that time that they, it's a Hungarian uh, young youngster team did some special equipment with which you can drink from the fire, um, fire fountains or how, how you call them in English. Um, you know where the firemen get water from and you install this little blue thing and then you can actually drink from it. And uh, it was a new thing that time. So we also uh, draw attention to that uh, special uh, new thing in the, in the urban environment. And yeah, if you just uh, go forward with the pictures, we also gave, besides having these points, always uh, having some connection to the local area. For example, Rakot is where we, uh, you see the team like being happy solving the riddle. Like we had a, a phone booth and they, they received the call there. So they had to find the spot somehow and suddenly the phone rang. Of course, somebody was from dialing their mobile phone. So it was really an exciting game with, with Jews. And we gave the teams like these uh, bubbles of speech. So they had to uh, choose something. And if you go forward the pictures, there is one picture when there is this uh, bubble thing that they had to find something that they should come up an idea what the building thinks, what the uh, bench thinks, or some some item from an urban environment. And, and they should think about, like maybe a tree should should think, oh, please dogs, don't piss on me. Or, or, or the bench would think, oh, please come sit on me. So again, we try to have the teams reflect on their environment and not just passing by the buildings or, or their urban environment, but try to think in a bif different bit different view and they had to take pictures of this, what the building thinks, whatever they say. So yeah, if you, you scroll with the pictures, there is one, one uh, with the graffiti things when they put this uh, word bubble on the building. So anyway, uh, people love these games and, and uh, if you organize and uh, advertise it well, then people will come and play again it's it's your responsibility how you can find oh here they had to dance with they had to roll the dice and there were six different options and one of them was to just ask a stranger to dance with and this old lady was very happy that uh, they actually uh, the team made her also dance. very very happy if you could find me a, a, a mate to dance why well, we'll let you know next time we have all right time. that's yes. fun i think um what you do is very very beautiful because you discover you make the city more approachable or recognize qualities which are not uh, maybe so so prominent before uh, but you also mentioned that the games should have um, a goal and i wanted to ask you what is your goal or for what is, do you do those games and what is the added value if you do the games or if you do the games also digitally then? Well, um, for us at that time, well, it was in 2014 and 15. So like five years ago, still disconnecting urbanism and games was still something more new than now. So actually we just wanted to experiment with the topic and see how far it can go. And um, for us in the micro level, the, the aim of the game was to to really get the people more connected. But this, this was just part of this conference and, and experimentation. So we didn't have a larger thing to implement it within, but we just wanted to experiment with the means, like how it could actually fit in a bigger puzzle, so to say. And for us, uh, as I mentioned recently, we deal a lot more with uh, participatory projects. And I don't say we don't deal with gamification in this sense anymore, but uh, again, we, we ex experience that if we organize exciting games, people 
will come. So it's, it's okay, but to really find this larger goal and okay, they connect and they are happy and they know more about the Danube or they know more about the, the prostitution in the 80s, it's very good. But after a while you have to step forward and that you need a larger project to cooperate with the municipality or dealing with the public space or something. So whenever we had that opportunity, we, and I don't say it's always a game per se, but uh, I think it's very exciting to talk and the previous speech, it was facilitation mentioned many, many different or many times. It's, it's, these are like border territories, like you say facilitation, you say games, it's, it's being in a process with like the facilitator is responsible for the process. And as you mentioned, I, I work as a facilitator. So again, there you work, make the team work a lot. And, and if it's fun, it's not called a game, but it's very similar in many ways. So I think it's, it's a very exciting to experiment with these uh, methodologies or, or technologies or methods, whatever you call them. But uh, in these days, we, we use more the facilitation part or, or we deal more with this, still trying to keep it playful and, and active and exciting. But if, if you have a, a bar of facilitation here and gamification here, we are more towards the facilitation now, but we still, I think in facilitation or any teamwork, you need to keep this fun element and, and, and the power of the team and, and little quests and little exciting stuff. Like I, I copy a link just, just so you see uh, uh, some picture I sent to uh, when, in our correspondence as well. But if you just uh, look at the pictures of this, I don't know if how much time we have still. One this minute. is our, how much? One, One minute. Okay, if you just click on that uh, link and, and you see in the news, uh, some of the pictures, like it was uh, in the 8th district uh, connected to one uh, re revitalization of one of the streets. We, we cooperated with, well, let's say the municipality's development office. So, so we created a website so, so we can inform the public. And, uh, and here we organized some events, uh, including a, a, a picnic where they, the people could come. And there we also use some of the games. And um, yeah, if you go down at the bottom, you see some of the pictures maybe. And, and yeah, if uh, it is a nice show, if you look at that, or so, so we created a map and they could uh, like we created small like swings or fountain or whatever. So they were actually playing a game of trying to locate them. You see those little icons, we cut them out so they could localize it on the map while keeping in mind that, okay, you cannot plant trees here because there is a cable of whatever. So. So it had rules like in a game. So, but it wasn't really a game, but it had game-like elements, so to say. So we, we, we still use these kind of things, but not as like closely called as games, but more close to facilitation. But I think it's always exciting to experiment with these kind of things. And that's my final word. Thank you very much, Silvia. Let's move over to Barcelona or Mallorca. I don't know, where are you exactly now, Olivier? I don't you? even know. I don't even know. Uh, we're online, basically. We're online. That's true. <laughs> it doesn't really matter anymore. Olivier, we have been working uh, together with you. You are co-founder of Platonic and Goteo. Yes. And uh, we work, for example, on Open Heritage, where you designed uh, a platform to invite participation of different, uh, let's say, neighborhood projects or different community projects. Yes. Um, also, you work a lot with, with existing platforms like the CDIM uh, to structure uh, participation processes. Um, also, you are running crowdfunding campaigns, a lot of things that already happen online. Now, tell us a little bit about how this, how, what, what, you know, games and playfulness uh, 
uh, why why they're important in this process? How can we go beyond traditional, maybe rigid and maybe a bit too strict uh, forms of participation if we use yeah. games? That's a really issue. So can you see my screen? Actually, can you see yep. people around the table? Somehow, uh, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of what's happening around. Like we have so many now citizen assemblies trying to tackle the climate issue. So that, that's that's a little bit where where we should go. So the title of uh, of my talk today is that democracy is fun. Uh, if we of course take it seriously, so on both sides, so both on the sides of policymakers, politicians, and citizens. Uh, but I totally agree with uh, Sylvia that uh, gamification needs to have a purpose. So what about using gamification for influencing politics, uh, our politics and the design of our cities. Uh, so that's a very really issue. So uh, in Platonic, we do uh, build both uh, analogical and digital tools for what we call a hybrid urban collaborative governance. And we do have the experience. It's not because of COVID. It's because we, we like to work this way and it's more effective for us. It's basically we work on digital transition. So we always use uh, games, uh, cooperation methodologies, which are offline, but also have their equivalent uh, or their transition into uh, the online world. So basically platforms we're building or we're contributing to. So all of them are open source. So everything I'm presenting today is open source and you can also, uh, and I guess the same with my, the previous games we've seen. So you can also uh, you know, contribute or, or play it with, or with your own communities. So basically, uh, talking about the game, so that's basically the, the you know, very low score of democracy basically in Spain, but probably in all Europe. Uh, so we, democracy is in a bad shape, right? Uh, we, have, we have zombies all around. We never know if, if zombies are the politicians or, or citizens, you know, because they don't, have the, you know, they don't have a clear mindset of what the rules are. So uh, there, there are serious rules, but yeah, there's like gamified rules that we should know about. So it, it's important to, uh, you know, really always come back to the basic and let's say that we need to create rules that everybody understands. But basically, if you look at this statistic, it's pretty uh, poor. So we have 74% of people in Spain that feel unsatisfied with the functioning of democracy. Uh, two or three people from marginalized neighborhoods never voted, right? That, that's something we, we know, it's a classic. And 41% 40, of people in Europe do not vote because they lack of trust in politics. So that's basically where the game is happening. Uh, so that's, that's also something we, we'd like to, to uh, look at because we have so many, uh, you know, counterfeits, activism. So uh, we all know about uh, participation on the uh, ra hardcore activist side, but we know less about how we can influence politics uh, through collaborative governance uh, uh, schemes, uh, which is basically, um, you know, making policymakers, politicians and citizens work together. So how can we get there? So that's a little bit of our obsession, right? Uh, but how can we also allow activists, our radical activists, being able to recognize the rules and be also able to participate? Because usually, uh, you know, they're not so patient with uh, with institutional rules. So it's it's important to to look at collaborative governance in that way. So, but the problem is usually we think about participation is only motivating us. So we we're really uh, ready to fight uh, only when democracy is threatened. But basically, in, you know, in between all elections, we need to be part of the game all the time and we need to reinvent the rules ourselves. So basically in, in Platonic, we're obsessed with uh, what we call a, a progressive engagement and digital participation. Uh, so, so, but really we need to think about building spaces, both analogical and digital, which are guaranteeing a safer space, what we call safer space, because it's never safe enough uh, for citizens to participate. And, and we'd like to see these spaces as, as open and inclusive uh, possible. So we have heard about the, the word of inclusivity. It gets even more complex when we get into uh, the dig digital gap, right? Uh, you know, what, what's the issue there? So, uh, but basically we're good at uh, uh, building uh, bridges between physical and dig digital world to improve uh, the impact of civic initiatives. So there's a few examples. So I'd like to talk about two examples uh, and interrupt me because uh, I, I tend to talk too much. Um, so basically, the, I'd like to share with you the, you know, when we extend our capacities, we talked about with Sylvia about, uh, you know, ga gamification and facilitation. We we are on the on the side on the edge, but basically, when the games are good and when the co-creation is good, when the facilitation is good, we obtain that type of results, which is very visual. That's uh, the second edition of an event called IT Camp, uh, organized together with the European Cultural Foundation. Uh, so we were a bunch of collective organizing that every year. So that's the example of the second one. Uh, so the methodology we built for that is called IDs on Wheels. So we have that typical co-creation moment. It's a three days event where we congregate, we have an open call and we have uh, uh, 50 IDs selected. 
and, and they're supposed to tackle the, you know, the building society with greater equality, sustainability, and a stronger sense of social justice. So that's their purpose. Uh, so with them, we work for in, during uh, like a, a real camp during three days. So what the idea was also to be able to recombine groups every day and then a little bit like having an inner city inside this uh, participatory space. But you know, that's, that's great. Lots of participation, lots of conversations, but then you have a real challenge here. You all have these famous post-its, nice drawings, and someone at the end of the three days is totally uh, um, starving for more. And then they have, there's someone in charge of reporting and say, wow, I got all these information. So a thousand post-its, I can't even read because people were too, too excited uh, when they were participating. So it's, it's nice, it works too well. So what do we do? How can we improve that? Basically, that's what we thought, well, the third, third edition should in integrate some kind of digital elements that allows participants really to measure their own progress, so that's important, but also for uh, the organizers to measure the progress and how, you know, uh, observing how uh, people uh, or collectives start to work together, how they're stronger together, and because also there's, there was an incentive in these ID camps, 25 of these 50 projects would get a grant to, for research, right? So they're competing and collaborating at the same time, but we need somehow to have data about their evolution as part of this environment we have been creating for them. Uh, so basically we don't have data. Uh, and basically what we try to bo uh, you know, improve in the, in the next edition is like, okay, let's allow people to have really simple conversations. Forget the, uh, all about these uh, uh, vertical walls where we use, you know, you, you stick all your post-its and your marvelous ideas and uh, trying to have conversations with someone in the, in the other side, but it's impossible because it's too big. Uh, so we thought like, let's make it everything horizontal. Let's just design role play. So I think it's something in common with the previous ex examples we had. So let's, let's participate with our bodies the same way we work. Uh, we, uh, we, we're basically uh, uh, participating in activist movement in the street. So we have conversations and then we build something together, but then we always have like, you know, we have these collective moment of conversations, but we need to ensure, and that's what we observed, this individual moment where collectives by themselves try to basically integrate all the uh, input from these conversations into something which we call the, the digital roadbook. Okay, so I, I, I don't have time really uh, to talk about all the elements, but we have the very visual elements in these, in these uh, spaces is, uh, and a very important figure that we invented, which is called the data taker, which is basically not a story maker, it's something, someone taking care of you know, tracking all the conversations. So we make sure that while we have these conversations, we don't have, as a participant, I don't have to take notes, I will find, the conversations and the trade, you know, all the, the chronology of the conversation on my dashboard when it's time to apply the lessons of the day on my own project, right? So that's that's important. Uh, so uh, what we basically did is, is build a new tool, it's called a Whatify, and it's a digital roadbook. And we thought about, you know, we like we have a concept which which called data turgy, which is basically adapting dramaturgy. Uh, into how data is uh, provided to you as a participant. So data or, or uh, you know, uh, information on the methodology. So what's happening today? You're not supposed to, to know it the day before. Uh, so we do uh, open new windows every day. And it was basically based on a six steps, um, uh, six steps methodology, which we don't have time to cover. But important, I think it's important to say uh, in the last edition, we received 600 uh, uh, initiatives and only 50 were able to get there. So we also ensured that the methodology and the tools were di on disposal for the non-selected projects. That's also important as an inclusive inclusivity, uh, um, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. a commitment. Yep. Uh, and, and important enough is that we, we basically classified the project coming in by level of maturity. And basically, if you go to step six, which is about setting up the scenario, if you have a clear idea of what you want to do and, and choose the tone of the, 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 uh, of the future, that seems to be some of the most advanced step. So they would start with step six because most of them were journalists, but then step, go to the basic steps, step one. You know, basically thinking about, do I have a clear idea or do I have conversations with the beneficiaries I'm trying to tackle? And most of them on step six, jumping from step six to step one would realize that they just like imagine the world of their beneficiaries, but they have never talked with them and they had no strategy to talk with them. So that's basically one of the lessons is like, even if you think you are a very mature project, it's, it's good to go get back to the basics of, uh, of uh, community building. So basically we also have sort, uh, all sorts of uh, physical elements. So we have a digital roadbook, but we make sure that we also have a, a physical roadbook, which is also good. So people can still take notes if they want to take notes on their own small uh, 
roadbook. So mm -hmm. uh, these are these are statistics yeah. on, on uh, how the methodology would work. So we have uh, we have uh, you know uh, ninety five percent of the ID makers uh, would reuse the methodology. So it's important to say so only one people one one member would be able to travel. So we need to ensure that the methodology is arriving on the table of the, these collectives when they get back to their countries. Again, everything is online, uh, so you can you have the instructions. Uh, we uh, we have built a repository of all these methodologies. You can find them. Yeah, if and you give us the link, we can we can share all this. Uh, yes, I cannot do yeah. it while I'm doing it. Uh, while I'm we can talking. do it later. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I one, so I have one question. Just um, hmm. please finish quickly, and then I have one question, and then we. Okay, I got more on a, on a hundred percent digital side of participation, just to show you uh, both sides of uh, of uh, what we add. Uh, so of course we've, you've mentioned that we, uh, our legacy is uh, we're building uh, open source platforms and we also contribute to open source platforms. We also applying game and gamification to how we build these platforms. So that's, an, that's, a, that's just a, a, a reminder that we also build these tools uh, uh, applying uh, gamification. All right, so I'd like just like to uh, mention our uh, experience with uh, two, two cities of, uh, of uh, Spain, which are working quite hard on uh, participation. So they've, they, they have civic tech uh, tools, they have uh, civic participation platforms. And curiously, these two, uh, the city of Madrid in Madrid and the city in Barcelona in Barcelona, they built on the same kind of tree of open source code, but they've gone completely on, the, on diverse direction, which is a shame, but basically, uh, it's important. We don't have time to to look at that, but if you have an academic, it's very important how the design of these platforms is really a reflection on on this type of schemes of participation that happen in these two different cities and how the city are built. So this, the design of the city in Barcelona is really like very well well designed. It's so an excess of design, an excess of institutionality, and in Madrid that would be the total excess uh, on, on on the other side. It's you know participation is like that's almost no rules. So at some point. Uh, we got to the point, um, being fast, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the City Council of Madrid would just like, because of the, our experience with civic crowdfunding and civic participation platform, say, well, we, we need help. Uh, we need help to build uh, uh, progressive engagement, engagement with our users. Did you know that that game, that's the best game, the board game I can play uh, and I can recommend? It's called Zombie City in Spanish, <laughs> Zombie Side. It's the best collective game you can find. It's, in, it's, it's, it's a lot of tension, but somehow when we, co we come to the data that we got from the platform, we realized that there was lots, lots of users, 6,000, 6,000, 1,000, how do you call that? 600,000 600, users. But then we called that game that they would be uh, building the the City Madrid decide like zombie city because basically what they had is a platform full of zombies all around that will that would start participating with no rules without not knowing the rules so it's just instead of participating there was a shutting at, at the city council because there was no interaction plan there was no design of a, of a rules or neither design of feedbacking so basically what we did is uh, uh, so we we're talking about a, a very specific scheme of participation called citizen initiatives which needs to get to a threshold of one percent of uh, the population living in the city should support your id so you go on referendum and we had there were so many many initiatives and only two of them in three years had reached the goal and two of them were, were not you know, from the capacity of the city to deal with it, and they didn't know about it on the, on the first day. So basically what we did is like, how can a civic tech platform talk and be ready to have this uh, you know, feedback loop with the users? And it's very simple. It's the basis of the old gamification. You need to, uh, each time there's an action performed by the, by the citizen, you need to provide feedback and you need to you know, make sure that they have a learning curve that goes up, up, the, up the sky almost. So you need to be prepared. So basically that's what we uh, redesigned. So basically we redesigned the roadmap or the route or the game for the citizen initiatives. So the, first of all, that they know that it's almost an impossible mission to get to such a, a, le, uh, a number of supports and, uh, from, from the citizens. And we just invented like intermediary thresholds where each time they had a dashboard and would which like unblock resources. So we would like leave a space. We would like uh, they would have interviews with a technician experts from the city to improve this, their their IDs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's how the dashboard looks, and it's very complex to build based on. So it's like a little bit like a runner help. Uh, runner hub, but for, for civic participation, right? So at the end of the uh, of the year, you should be able to have reached the threshold of, of uh, signature and, and to, to go on referendum. So the, we've, we've been creating all sorts of automatic resources, just like, you know, uh, project get posters if, you, if they get to a threshold of 1,000 signature, et cetera, et cetera. And, the mo and I want to stop there. The most exciting one, uh, is citizen jury. So uh, at, at some point, if you, if you get to a, a certain numbers of signature, 
uh, we look every, twice a, uh, a year, we look at the uh, most voted or most supported initiative and it goes on civic, uh, um, uh, uh, on, uh, on citizen jury. So I don't know if you know about civic sortition, but it's basically what's happening now. It's, it's, the, it's the future of all that game we're talking about. It's a way of, of, uh, of coming back to uh, build the democracy by representative citizens. And basically that's basically where I, when I want to I wanna stop, you know, uh, basically that's the future, that's the way to go. So we need really to need to make clear that the civic sortition is working. It's another type of game. We need to know the rules. We need to be the culture of, uh, of basically uh, be able to understand governance rules of, uh, of, uh, of our cities, but also being be able to influence on how these rules can change. So civic lottery would be one of the most uh, uh, important uh, game to play in the future. That would Thank be you, it. Olivia. And this is something we see uh, a lot of municipalities experimenting with. And it was very important that you highlighted that uh, what happens when you bring together like hundreds of creatives or 50 of creatives who are developing their project, or what happens when you have to build a process that is uh, plugged into municipal decision making. And this is, has different modalities, but you can use elements of game in both cases. I would hand it over to Bahanur, who Thank would you very move much. to Ileana. Uh, our last guest for today is Ileana Toscano. Uh, she's an urban specialist and she supports uh, administrations to deliver good governance projects. I would like to ask Ileana, is democracy fun? And where are you joining us from? Would you like to explain our, your work to us? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, I think that democracy is fun and needs to be fun. And for that reason, we need to find even uh, uh, always uh, innovative and playful tools for addressing the participation of citizens. And this is one of the reasons uh, why the playful, the, the partners join the network I am facilitating uh, as a lead expert funded by Hulbacht uh, with the name of Playful Paradigm. And the cities decided to join that network uh, because they um, were looking for new solutions for engaging with their citizens and also for boosting the social inclusion. So I would like to share some images if I can. I, I forgot to say that I am in Trieste now, so in Italy, in the northeast of Italy. Trieste. It's snowing, it's very strange, but the upside is snowing, so it's, uh, it's very cold, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, we are inside. Fortunately, or unfortunately, for that for that period. So, uh, as I said, uh, the the network I am leading and I am facilitating is called the Playful Paradigm, and it is a transfer network. What means a transfer network? Means that uh, um, all of this network funds by Eurobank as a lead partner who has developed for a long time a good practice and that practice has to be transferred and adapting in other cities across Europe. In the case of Playful Paradigm, as you can imagine, the, the, the commitment of the partnership is to work on the topic of play, on the philosophy of play. And the other cities involved in that process are Katowice in Poland, Klaipeda in Lithuania, Cork in Ireland, Viana do Castello in Portugal, Esplugas degli Obrigati in Spain, Larissa in Greece, and Novigrad in Croatia. I forgot maybe to say that the lead partner is the municipality of Udine in Italy. And uh, uh, in addressing play, in uh, trying to, um, to use the play as a, a, a very crossing tool for several things, the municipality of Udine for many years uh, uh, used that tool for promoting the social inclusion and for triggering the, the uh, civic participation and for address uh, innovative concept of environment behavior. So the Playful Paradigm Partners decided to join that network for trying to transform the urban environment into great places to live by the help of play. But just a few words about the history of the first practice, the good practice developed by the municipality of Udine. The municipality of Udine started almost 20 years ago to, um, to build an urban policy dealing with play. They decided to 
try to tackle the challenge, the contemporary challenges of urbanization, aging population and pollution by promoting a series of play initiatives to be organized across the city. And the first infrastructure, the first brick to build that, uh, uh, that philosophy of play in, in Udine was to, to launch the tool of uh, uh, a mobile toy library. The mobile toy library was very useful for the municipality of Udine to reach the several districts across the city and also to promote play activities during the summertime. But uh, infrastructure of play, when a city decided to promote a play philosophy using in several, uh, in, in several uh, um, teams, methodologies, and also in several areas of his municipality is not enough. And for that reason, and I think that the most important thing of the municipality of Udine is that they decided to open an office inside the municipality dealing with play activities. They hired the three uh, people in charge to follow all the play activities to manage the, the mobile toy library. Then they open also a toy library and also in the National Archive of Games uh, here in Italy. And th that staff is in charge to manage all of this, uh, all of this infrastructure and of course to organize to, to plan and to promote several educational activities dealing with play. And they are doing that by involving other games experts, by involving local communities and stakeholders. So in transferring the good practice approach, the partner cities, the other partner cities have been experimenting the power of play because the play is a powerful tool for engaging citizens, for engaging local communities, for engaging children, adults, older people, and also people, um, vulnerable people, and also migrant people. So for the, the aim uh, of that, for playful paradigm, is to try to redesign cities, to claim streets open to play, to educate children and adults also about sustainability. And here uh, I put some examples from our partner. Here we are in Cork. And they, um, they designed this motto, open for play. Indeed, the Cork took the opportunity to rethink to city spaces, especially some areas not so used or not so well used areas, as for example, a, an area close to the river, so called the marina, and also the public spaces in front of the schools. And in those, in those spaces, they decided to remove cars and to open the space open for play for pedestrians and also for cyclists. They promoted a sound, playful uh, um, place making across the city by engaging some play leaders across the community. They train those play leaders and those play leaders have been in charge to spread the voice about play and to organize some playful initiative in several neighborhoods of Cork. In Esplugas de Llobregat uh, in Spain, they decided to use the playful approach, the playful paradigm philosophy to engage citizens, to, pro, to better involve their citizens and organizing several participatory processes by using play. And of course, for uh, trying to, um, to adapt some of the activities within the playful paradigm, uh, within the playful paradigm program, as for example, the mobile toy library, and they are also willing to open a toy library, a physical toy library with several toy library satellites in the city, because the main goal of Splugas del Llobregate is to engage as more um, people they can by using play, uh, the, the play activities. Eliana, that Hello. sounds very... Very, very interesting. Uh, and I think uh, all the examples also shown in other cities are really powerful to, to show what playing can, um, can uh, how playing can uh, enrich our urban environment. But uh, I have one question. Uh, because we have also placemaking projects and other urban regeneration projects, and whenever the administ administration is involved, 
the processes to change anything within the administration are normally so long. For instance, if you activate a city part uh, street and so on with playing, and then nothing happens, or how long does it take that the street can be really uh, reshaped and rechanged that it is a play uh, play area and not anymore for cars and so on? Because all those activities are temporary, and I think you are doing great job in in changing behavior or uh, unfolding the uh, fantasy of people. And what does the administration do after this? Do you have any stories or experience yeah. in this regard? I don't know if I have understood very well the question, but uh, I think that, uh, uh, yes, placemaking and also the tactical urbanism by using play are a kind of experiment, for example, to uh, close the street to, to cars and to the uh, vehicle mobility and to open for play, for example, in the, in the case of Playful Paradigm. In Cork, um, the example I showed before, they reached to close definitely the, the street, for example, in, uh, in the marina, because uh, uh, they decided to first open the street for play for several uh, weekends. And then they definitely close, uh, close the street to cars and open the street for other, for other use, for people, for bicycles, and for promoting play in those streets. So what, uh, um, yes, also following, I have some other examples, but not from cities, but more about the methodology used by Playful Paradigm. I think that what we learned from the Playful Paradigm partners is that we don't need to direct play. We don't need to, to learn to people to play. We just need to make the space playful because the people need places where can meet where they can play together and feel uh, comfortable to stay. So uh, I think that what also I learned uh, in the Playful Paradigm Transfer Network is the difference between gamification and play. Because uh, as the, the, the others uh, guess, uh, uh, I have also a profile as a facilitator mainly. And uh, I have already used in other, in other participatory process, the gamification, for example, to, to provide the participation, to try to, to engage better the communities. But what, the, what I understood um, by the experts of games involved in the playful paradigm is that uh, gamification is not uh, the good way to address play. Because uh, when we open the streets to play, when a city decided to promote play, play is just for playing. And it is the main concept. Uh, we are trying to, to, uh, to address also for other cities. So the Playful Paradigm is more a philosophy and this, the municipalities decided to join our network. They are understanding that there is a, a, a huge philosophy behind which will use the playful approach for several, for several uses. For example, for promoting the, the, health, the health city, the healthy city. And the many partners of Playful Paradigm are also in the partnership with the WHO organization uh, with healthy cities networks. And they are used many times, especially for elderly people and for families, uh, um, marginalized families, the, the, the tools of play, for example. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Ileana. Amazing uh, that you yeah. have such success. I would like just to, to fun, fi, uh, finalize my presentation, if I can, with the last slide, because I have also some digital, with this slide, because I think it's the most important, because the playful paradigm is also promoting the idea to, uh, to, to launch the capital, the European capital of play. And we presented that during the 18 European week of region and cities, and the committee of the region is supporting us to create the capital of play, the European capital of play, where the cities has to be to be to be open uh, to make the space more playful. Thank you. Wonderful, Eliana. I would like to give the word to Levente for the final question because we are already we are running over late. Time. <laughs> yes, but thank you very much for for explaining and exploring with us uh, your projects. Uh, one question that we wanted to talk a little bit more about is the digital dimension that uh, uh, some of you mentioned a little bit. My, my basic question to you, and I'm, I'll ask you to just 
really answer in, in, a, in a very few sentences uh, is on, you know, in the last six months, we have a lot of trouble meeting in person. So a lot of games that we or you were doing before, they're not working anymore. We saw in the case of locals, no, you built up a, a completely new game based on the one you had uh, in physical space. Are these games that we start playing online, are they the same games uh, from physical space just put online or we, do we need very different dynamics online? Of course, Olivier, you've been working with the digital for a long time, so maybe you are, you, you have to deal with other things now that there's a digital fatigue, that people are really maybe fed up with spending so much time in front of the computers. Uh, Ileana, I'm sure your Urbex network has is, is been uh, reinventing uh, the, the possibilities. And Sylvia, I think you've been also a bit constrained uh, from, well, you, you could do this participatory process in physical space, but uh, there are new questions and new challenges that you, you cannot do there anymore. So if you can very briefly uh, tell us about what is the diff, how do you see the relationship of the digital games related to the physical games you are playing? Let's start with locals. Okay. Uh, yeah. So in, in, our, in our case, uh, when people play the game physically, uh, there is always the thing about the human touch. Uh, in the end of the, the day, you are uh, around the table playing some cards with people you know or you don't know, but you are playing cards. In, in fact, uh, that's the, the dynamic of the thing. You are going to co-create the project uh, based on these, uh, on these dynamics of cards, uh, almost like in a table of a, of a coffee, uh, in, that, in that kind of spirit. Doing that transition to digital, it's not a soft process. It's far away from being a soft process. And we had to reinvent the, the game dynamics because, because that stages of the game, the, the COVID crisis and the, the going, the, 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 the discard cards, go, another, go and get another card and all of those six steps that, uh, that we have to that we had came up with, it's somehow uh, a way of tackle that uh, that uh, that absence of uh, being with persons. So we 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 felt that we need to have some thrill. We have to to have some uh, some new dynamics so people don't get uh, fed up. Because that's one th one thing is certain: the game can be the most interesting thing in the world, but. This dynamic of have, of speaking to a computer to have a set of headphones, people will get fed up. And, and all the technical have... issues that come yeah. up. Yeah, and uh, yes, yes, yes. So and more, strong... it takes more time. <laughs> yes. So for for us, it was to ensure the, the in short in the period of uh, people playing the people playing the game. Uh, to give them more steps and more mini tasks, more micro processes for people to be uh, to be engaged yes. with uh, with the thing, but eventually, if the game took more, uh, I would say thirty minutes. Uh, I think everybody would say, "Come on, just finish this and let us get some mm -hmm. lunch," because uh, yeah. yes, we just uh, I think shortly it's, uh, we tried to cre create the more uh, similar environment to what it would be physically and to make it more human in this sense that we are behind the machine um, talking to each other, but yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Sylvia, I interrupted you, but you were already about to say something. Uh, it wasn't me, but yeah, oh, yeah I sorry. think I'm in the same order as we presented. I think as in many other things, the meetings, the trainings, the facilitation, digital can, the best digital thing can get to maybe the 70 or maximum the 80% of the physical one. So even if you do, I don't know, the best ever, you cannot reach above a certain limit. And in the future, if this COVID slows down or gets something better, I think digital can be a very good compulsory or a, a complementary thing to the physical. So. On the positive side, we learned that many things can actually work digitally and you don't have to travel two times half an hour to get a half an hour meeting. So I think if you have some physical, especially at the beginning or the end and maybe some in between, you can shift some of the things to digital and, and it can work very well. But purely digital, I think it's a lot of effort and, and it has to be a lot more focused, a lot more 
dynamic and a lot more, it needs a lot more uh, work, preparatory work to, to go well. Mm -hmm. So, but I think it's a good thing to keep, but uh, it needs some, especially in this urban participatory uh, context, it needs the physical part as well. <laughs> Thank you. Olivier, I think yeah. you didn't agree with what Sylvia said in the beginning. The future generation, which exactly. is in the hands of Sylvia. You know, future Who don't have to learn to play here. again. Yes. No, but what, what, I could, what we could say, and, and coming back maybe to, to Barcelona, we know about the super islands, which were, you know, Eliana was talking about playing, playing really physical games. So we have all these uh, new uh, type of uh, architecture plan uh, based on reopening uh, these, uh, these uh, public spaces. Uh, funny enough, it's, it's, uh, the city in Barcelona has been conceived uh, on the scheme of, uh, you know, the you know, let's say the traditional and uh, digital participation that was happening naturally in, in Barcelona. So basically what we've seen is that the, the platform was working very, very well based on an uh, hybrid uh, participation, basically. So there's a lot of effort of facilitation, uh, assemblies, and people are used to, you know, meet in the street, meet in physical spaces. So basically that's basically where the, the, the work should be uh, done. And I'd like to tell you about an example. It's also about uh, identifying new type of communities that are under an urgency scheme. So basically we have, uh, we have helped uh, the syndicate of uh, Catalonian health workers during the COVID to set up their participatory space. And we had to build that knowing that they, have, they had only 10 minutes a day to participate digitally. But it, need, it needed to be mobile first. Uh, the question was you know, no time to debate, decision-making straight away. Uh, so there's no space for gamification, but, be, but just because you know that these type of uh, beneficiaries need another kind of rule. So that's also interesting to find out, and we, we're looking for you know communities that uh, also present like radical challenges for us that need to go 100% online because there's no other way yep. uh, for them to have these meetings and taking decisions. So uh, we'd like to work also on, on the necessity of some communities to be 100% online. And, and then from the experience of different uh, uh, European projects, we spend so much less using digital tools like a participatory platform than traveling so much. So. I you know we have we have an eco footprint which is improving a lot, and unless uh, also data is also having a large eco footprint that we need to consider, uh, but at least it's uh, it's important to say also. And then it's more for participatory work as Sylvia was was mentioning. So for us, it's uh, we calculated it. It's three times more work to prepare all the particip facilitation online, but on the reporting side. You know, we make sure that we have all this digestion and all the participation transformed into data that really uh, serve the purpose of reporting on our activities. So for the city, it's great. We have, uh, we have improved data sets after that type of participation. That's, that's on the effective side of things. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, Eliane, I think I interrupted you in the end. Uh, yes. Sorry for that. No, 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 thank you. Yeah, I, I agree completely with all of uh, other speakers uh, and especially with the idea to, to bust the blend formula because I think that after the COVID pandemic crisis ended, we will uh, uh, focus on new way of engaging people by promoting a hybrid form of participation and also by using I hope uh, play for engaging for engaging participants. So I think that we need new tools. We need to reinvent the tools of uh, online participation, as we need to to reinvent the tools for playing online, especially focusing on urban regeneration and, and urban planning. I would like just to share an example from our network, and I think that in the first during the first lockdown was what was a great example built by project partners was to try to, uh, to create a tool for local communities by uh, promoting play. So a way to stay close to, to, to those in need, especially to families, to families with small children, and uh, the partners created this uh, uh, online resource, so-called Play at Home Resources. And what was great, and this is the, the powerful tool to be a network of European uh, cities, different cities, was that uh, uh, cities shared the different games, the different games they developed in their local context. And those games have been translated in the eight languages of uh, our partners. I think that this, in my opinion, is one of unexpected results, but a very great result of our network. Okay, thank you very much, Ilian, and thank you all for uh, this amazing inputs. This is a very exciting discussion that I think is just beginning, at least uh, 
for many people. So I hope we can uh, later on uh, continue the, this discussion, hopefully when we can already also meet physically, or at least uh, we can do complementary online and offline activities. I hand it over to Bahnur and... Uh, yes, I, I would love to see the link of all the previous presented, I mean, the platonic and the card game and everything. Uh, Yes, we will share everything on, on Facebook and then we will have an article, a summary of this event and uh, the video okay. uh, posted in many places, so you, you cannot avoid it, okay. actually. Okay. Yes, as, uh, as Levante said, you will see in Facebook the, the links for today's meeting and you will see uh, soon also on the uh, cooperativecity.org uh, the, the full video is a link uh, to, to YouTube. Uh, where the video will be streamed or be online. Um, I wanted to thank you all. We are very sorry that we had to cut you short. Your beautiful contributions were very important. This is the last um, Cooperative City in Dialogue for this year. We will meet next year. Therefore, we have a lot of time uh, to think about how we can use digital or games over the Christmas. And uh, we will probably come back with a game next year. Thank you also to my colleagues in Utropian. Thank you, Jorge. Sorry that you are sick and couldn't be with us. And also to Giovanni, who uh, typed all those links on Facebook. And we will be very happy to have you with us in the new year, in January. Take care. Thank you very much. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.